the uh, difficult part of doing the miniatures for 2010 was the fact that Kubrick had thrown away everything from 2001. We had nothing. We had no drawings from the art department. We had no uh, movie stills provided by them. We had to grab those actually, you know, from the film itself, and then work after after the fact, as it were. And then uh, Sid Mead, uh, of course, came in and did some wonderful drawings for the Lanoff. But everything relating to the Discovery and the Star Child um, was uh, some stuff that we had to regenerate from scratch. The thing that took a good deal of my time was developing uh, cryogenic engine effects, uh, kind of based on the technology that Grant had worked out on uh, Battlestar Galactica with the big vapor trail that comes out the back of the Vipers. You know, it's a combination of quartz halogen lighting and cryogenic fog coming out with the quartz uh, lighting it up to make it look like incandescent uh, cloud of energy or something. So I wanted to kind of capitalize on that and do it on a grand scale. Peter Himes wanted a bit of a of a move because the original Star Child was a fiberglass locked off puppet and I think they only had a small very slight camera move uh, on this rigid puppet but he wanted the Star Child to blink its eyes and he wanted it to have some kind of a subtle move with one of its hands. So that puppet was made out of gelatin. This was before it was discovered that silicon could be um, turned into a perfect replication of human flesh. The problem with human flesh has always been uh, when you're trying to imitate it for film, flesh doesn't reflect light the same way that a painted object does. Flesh, human flesh allows light to go in a little bit and kind of break up a little bit and then bounce back out. There are layers to the human epidermis that give it a certain luminosity that is very, very difficult to imitate. Well, gelatin was found to be a close approximation. You could even go in afterwards and, with an airbrush and do little delicate veins and shadings and so forth. But uh, it was basically translucent, and so we were told that this was going to be the hot setup for making this actual rod puppet that we could articulate. So Stuart Ziff was brought in to make blinking eyes. And they also, by the way, wanted the eyes to be able to converge, to go from infinity, when the two optical axes are exactly parallel, to a very, very slight convergence, as if the baby was focusing on something. So Stuart worked and worked and worked on that. And he got the convergence down, and it was nice. It was subtle and very smooth and clean. But trying to do an eye blink with little metal wires placed inside this wet, water-based gelatin proved to be a nightmare. And so I don't think that you ever see the baby actually blink its eyes, because it would have destroyed the lids every time the servos came on. But Stuart was tired. Stuart had just come off of Ghostbusters. He wanted to take some time off. They brought him back in almost at gunpoint, and it was like, no, no, we got to have you. You have to do this. Please. How much do you need? What would it take? So Stuart named his price. And he came back and he did it. He, did, he gave it his best shot. It wasn't 100%, but it was probably undoable, given the problems, given the tiny tolerances, given the water on everything the delicate little servos, the little pieces of music wire molded into the rubber. Had it been rubber, had it been latex, you probably could have pulled it off, but they wanted it to look real. They wanted it to look alive. And in the movie, the shot is brief enough that you don't miss the fact that, even though it was a great disappointment to Peter Himes, you don't miss the fact that the baby doesn't manage to blink his eyes. He looks a lot more alive than the fiberglass one from 2001 did.